Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So on Thursday afternoon, I was sitting in my office working on my sermon for today. The words that I was writing at the time were much different than the words that you will hear this morning. For as I was writing, word came that Queen Elizabeth II had died. I, like the rest of the world, was shocked but not surprised. Earlier in the day, the family had released an unusual statement that the Queen was under watch of her doctors. It's strange because normally the family is very silent on the health of the monarch, but this became a very worrying statement. Now, it may seem odd to some that here in America we are paying tribute to the British monarch, but I ask for your forgiveness as I believe it's appropriate to spend some time in tribute to this extraordinary woman. The Queen was a devoted servant of her people, swearing to them at the young age of 21 that she would devote her entire life, whether it be long or short, to their service. It is rare in these days to find someone who is willing to serve others ahead of themselves for their entire life. But this is something that she did. But more importantly than all of this, she was a woman of enormous faith and a faith that she was not afraid to share with the world. Among the many titles that are showered upon the monarch, she carries the title of Supreme Governor of the Church of England and Defender of the Faith. She took both roles very seriously. It's also interesting to note that when the new monarch takes the oath, that part of the oath is to swear to the protection and the independence of the Church of Scotland. Religion and faith are very much a part of the role of the song. In her Christmas message in 2014, the Queen had this to say as an indication of her faith. For me, the life of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, whose birth we celebrate today, is an inspiration and an anchor in my life, a role model of reconciliation and forgiveness. He stretched out his hands in love, acceptance, and healing. Christ's example had taught me to seek and to respect and value all people of whatever faith or none. As Americans, one of the things that we prize above all else is the separation of church and state. Now, over the last few years, politically, these lines have been blurred on both sides. Politicians use the church when it sees fit, and the church is politics when it sees fit. So we're not really used to hearing our leaders speak so openly and more importantly, honestly, about their faith and how it guides them. Now sure, we have politicians, again, who use any opportunity to flaunt their faith, going so far perhaps as to clean out a square in front of a church for a photo op. But to hear such a pure understanding of faith and what faith is all about is refreshing. Now, the words spoken by the Queen in her 2014 message should be familiar words to all of you. Since I have repeated these words, not that I count myself regal in any way. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be funny, by the way. <laughs> but I speak about this a lot because it's central to my understanding of the message of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. She spoke of reconciliation and forgiveness, and just last week, I spoke of the importance of forgiveness in the life of a Christian. Now, you will remember that forgiveness, as I see it, is again central to our spiritual life and of great importance in our development of that spiritual life. But she speaks of forgiveness and reconciliation on a personal level, as well as a corporate level. We must seek forgiveness for past wrongs, whether they be individual wrongs, wrongs committed by the church, or wrongs committed by a nation. Now, as of late, it seems that seeking forgiveness can be perceived somehow as weakness. The very idea that we as a nation should apologize for how we treated the native population or those we have enslaved seems to be wrong. There is a sense that we should whitewash over that portion of our history and remove all of it. 
This from the same group of people who feel that taking down statues that honor those who took up rebellion against our country is somehow canceling culture. We must embrace all of our history, the good and the bad. And we must stand ready always to apologize, even though we were not personally involved as a nation, we must seek forgiveness for things that our nation has done. No one is perfect. No individual is perfect. No nation is perfect. And so it comes time that we have to ask for this forgiveness. In 2011, Queen Elizabeth was the first British monarch to visit the Irish Republic in a century. That visit's been hailed as a moment of forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, of course, nothing is instantaneous, and there are those who, as I mentioned last week, especially my Celtic ancestors, that passed down their trials and tribulations with each other through generations and generations. It's passed on through our DNA. I think I recalled by saying, Someone, so-and-so stole my sheep 3,000 years ago, and therefore I must hate them and seek out their destruction at any cost. So reconciliation and peace is difficult, but it has to begin at some place. Nothing is inter instantaneous. And forgiveness is not immune to that. But these moments, these times when people come together, start the process. And as Christians, we should be at the center of these times. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, and as such, we should always seek peaceful means to resolve our issues. The Queen spoke of how Jesus stretched out his hands in acceptance and reconciliation. Again, I believe that these are two central ideas and ideals in the life of the Christian. Now, I've mentioned before that the outstretched arms of Jesus on the cross is a symbol, a symbol of welcome. Not for some, not for just those who were chosen, not for those who were there, not for those who wear the right clothes or say the right things or put the right amount of money in the collection plate, although I might argue that one. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. The arms were stretched for all, and that means all. He didn't say as he hung there, this is just for some of you. I only do this for the following people. It was for all. I often say that what was left for us is an example to follow. The example of Christ hanging on the cross, for me, is not the idea of the inhumanity of what was done the brutalness of what was done. For me, it's the willingness to accept that and the fact that the symbol of that is the open arms and welcome, much like a parent would welcome their children. And it's reminiscent of the parable of the prodigal son, where we see the father who welcomes back without question the son who had squandered his inheritance. The son who had gone off, who had left everything. But yet when he returned, the father, notice the father, I didn't say the other son. We'll deal with that at another time. But the father welcomed his son with open arms. In Christ Jesus, all is forgiven. And because of that, we are given a seat at the table. The table of reconciliation and the table of Now, healing is another aspect of this relationship with Jesus. And I don't speak of healing in the physical sense, although that is possible. But Jesus makes possible the healings of past hurts. We talked about this last time. We talked about our ability to begin to heal after something that happens. And it may take forever. We may never heal from what happened. But through the grace that we receive, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, gives us that ability to start and make it even possible. 
from the cross, the instrument that the state chose to kill him, Jesus looked down upon those who had just nailed him there. And rather than shout insults at them, rather than tweet his disappointment with everything, he looked down upon them and asked God to forgive them. It was a matter of insult that he was crucified between two thieves. One of those thieves asked for forgiveness. Jesus turned to him and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't ask what he had done. He didn't force him to say the sinner's prayer. He didn't ask him how many Bible verses he knew or how many times he had been to church. He simply said, You are forgiven. His last thoughts from the cross were not for himself. His last thoughts were for those around him. England and the United Kingdom is a very diverse place and has been for a very long time. And although the Church of England is the established church, there is room in society for all expressions of faith and no expression of faith. Yesterday, senior members of Parliament took the oath of allegiance to the new king. And as part of that oath, they say the words, by Almighty God. And at the end, they say, so help me God. I was struck by the fact that not everyone used those words. Because not everyone believes the same way. And yet there's allowance made for that to happen. At those times, I often think about how that same situation would play out here. I often think about how in some quarters, and I'm sure it happened there too, but in some quarters there'd be shouts of how we shouldn't allow these people to serve in our halls of government because they don't respect either tradition or the fact that there is a sovereign, a sovereign God. But for some people, that's not always the way. The expressions of faith are as varied as the people. And she understood this. In 1954, the Reverend Billy Graham was visiting England as part of his famous crusades. It's interesting that someone went there on a crusade and instead of them coming somewhere else on a crusade, but there it is. The gospel that Graham was preaching was not really in alignment with the theology of the Church of England, yet the Queen welcomed him to preach at Windsor Castle. She took a lot of criticism for that, from the Church and from her subjects. But she had a depth and breadth of understanding of theology that transcended that of the Church of England. She was undoubtedly Anglican. But she had a respect and understanding of others' faith, and again, those of no faith. But I think this goes more than simply a religious acceptance. I think it's easy to say, we accept everyone. I think it's easy to say, we accept everyone, regardless of their faith or of no faith. But do we practice that? Do we really, honestly believe that? And I think she did. During her 96 years of life, she saw monumental changes in the world. When she was born, her grandfather was an emperor. The empire is gone. And in her lifetime, she witnessed the dissolution of that empire and the creation of the Commonwealth. No longer was the relationship the conqueror and the conquered, but friends, much like our relationship with God. No longer do we need to fear God. We've talked about this before. We talked about the smiting nature of God and how there's always those who say when something bad happens, God sent the hurricane to wipe out so-and-so because of such-and-such. Such. To which I respond, well, what about all the good people that got wiped out? Well, they're just collateral damage. I don't want to be collateral damage. I don't know about you. But the God that I serve, the God of grace, the God of love, does no such thing. With the changes that happen, the changes that happen in the world comes an acceptance of 
all walks of life. Again, something that's very basic to the life of a Christian and one that I've spoken about before. But this also is a good time to talk about grief. A lot of my work outside the church involves grief and dealing with people who are in grief. As I mentioned at the start of the service, today is a remembrance of not only the life of the Queen, but of the events of 21 years ago in New York City, Washington, D.C., and in that field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Now, although we may not have experiences of personal grief from that day, and by that I mean to say we may not know anyone that was killed on that day, but we have shared a national grief, which continues. Already we're seeing in various social media platforms the images of that day, the images of planes flying into buildings. But for me, the lasting image of that day is not the violence and is not the hatred. It's the love. It's the love that happened after, when all of us came together. One of the inspirations that, for me, that came out of that was the uh, New York City Fire Department chaplain, Father Michael Judge. Mm -hmm. Father Michael uh, was a Franciscan Roman Catholic priest, and he was killed on that day. There's various stories of how it happened. Uh, one of the more popular and probably true was that he was kneeling, ministering to someone when he was struck by debris falling from the tower. There's an image of him being carried from the ground by five firefighters. They brought him to a nearby church where they laid him. I read an article recently that said that perhaps that action saved those five firefighters' lives because they had left the scene to carry their chaplain. And while they were gone, the towers came down. In his last act, he saved five lives. The enduring image for me is that photo. Google it when you get a chance. That photo speaks to me of love, of care, and of service to those who serve. He is a large part of the reason I do what I do. I never met him. I had never heard of him before that day. But he had such a huge impact on my life because of those events that in many ways he probably changed the course of my life. But we share this grief. We all of us experience grief in a different way. And regardless of what experts say, we never get over it. You never get over grief. You never get over losing someone that you love. We get used to them not being there. We have had a lot of grief in the last 21 years. We've had a lot of grief as individuals, and we've had a lot of grief as a nation. We all experience different. The sharp edges of grief give way to the smoothness of life, but that grief is always there. And in the words that she wrote to our nation after the events of 9-11, the Queen said that grief is the price we pay for love. If you don't want grief, don't love. But it's the price we pay. Our, life cha our lives changed on that beautiful morning in September of 2001, and our lives will never be the same. Now, times of remembrance are good. Times of remembrance are good as long as they lead us away from anger and toward this idea of forgiveness and reconciliation. Now this won't, won't be very popular in some quarters, what I'm about to say next, but I feel that it has to be said. We do not have to forget, but we absolutely have to forgive. We have to, we have no other choice. As Christians, 
we have no choice but to forgive. Now for some, that may be impossible. And that's okay. But we have to try. Anger is destructive. We saw what anger did. Love didn't create those events. Anger, hatred created those events. Forgiveness brings us above that and allows us to begin to heal. Now today we pause to remember those whose lives were lost on that day and those whose lives have been lost since then. But again, we also should pause to remember how we all came together on that day and the days that followed. We stretched out our hands to our neighbors and we embraced one another in our collective grief. And for a short period of time, we came together, we prayed together, and we cried together. Again, that's what I choose to remember about that day. And when I say, I will never forget, that's what I won't forget. Not the burning and collapsing buildings, but neighbor helping neighbor and friend helping friend. It's the Christian thing to do, but it's the human thing to do. Ritual is important. And our ability to come together and come to grips with our grief is aided through ritual. Tonight, our community will gather for ritual. We will gather for ritual as we commemorate those that were lost. And this week, a nation and the world will gather for ritual as they say farewell to their queen. We've seen a bit of it already, and might I say, it's spectacular. If there's one thing the Brits know how to do, is put on a show. I think they have a hat and a costume for everything. <laughs> Someone asked, where do they keep all that stuff? I said, somewhere there's got to be a huge closet that it's all hanging in. But there it is. It's ritual. Ritual is important. These things that for us may seem strange and outdated, ritual is important. One of the interesting parts of all this is that in the midst of their grief, there's also a celebration. The queen has died, but as the queen herself said, tomorrow the daffodils will bloom. Life goes on. The queen is dead. Long live the king. We strip away all the pageantry, and behind all of that, we need to remember that there is a family that is mourning family that's mourning the loss of their mother, their grandmother, and their great-grandmother. My thoughts this day and the days to come will be with them, with the new king, as the new king not only deals with his own grief, but needs to lead his nation and perhaps the world in mourning. And my thoughts are also with those who grieved their losses 21 years ago and those who have died since then. For me, the legacy of Her Majesty will be her faith and the idea that she was able to be queen of all of her subjects, but at the same time, she was not afraid to live her Christianity in public. She didn't lord it over people. She didn't insist that England believed this way or that way. She didn't even insist that England was a Christian nation, whatever that means. Her faith influenced and guided every aspect of her life. And it is that memory that I will take from all of this. But at the end of the day, a Christian has died. And we pray that she's been welcomed into the arms of her Savior, and she hears these words that we all hope to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant.